and it's um, it's a year-round paper uh, which is uh, based on the observation that uh, still you know a lot of what we do and uh, and study about seabirds is uh, is based on the breeding season uh, which is important of course uh, and it's a time during which we we see them and um, and study them a lot on land uh, but after that uh, seabirds vanish into what uh, Rachel Carson called uh, the aero ocean and uh, very often we we don't really know what they do uh, except um, now with data loggers uh, we have far more insight about their their year-round lives at sea and uh, and that's really fascinating um, so the the study by by Ruthven and colleagues um, is focused on uh, on common guillemots uh, from the Isle of May of the Firth of Forth in, in Scotland um, and uh, what they, they did is, uh, was to, to equip 30 uh, birds with GLSs in 2005 and, uh, and they recovered 13 of those in 2006. And the, the GLS data showed that the, um, the common guillemots mainly stayed in the North Sea um, and I was, I was surprised actually once more how resident they are around the British Isles. I'm, I'm not even sure you can really speak about, about migration. Um, and what surprised me also uh, was uh, to see how far north they were in the North Sea uh, and of the North Sea in the middle of winter. They didn't seem to move much southward during that, that period. Um, and the GLSs that the team used um, are, are very neat because uh, they not only record and process the light levels on board, but uh, it's also a, a time depth temperature recorder. Uh, so you get a lot of information which um, Ruth and her colleagues um, used to work out uh, time energy budgets. Um, basically, they had information uh, for one full day every uh, two weeks uh, during uh, across the winter phase, and uh, and they use these uh, time energy budget information to uh, to estimate energy requirements. Um, the energy requirements were really high during the breeding season, uh, which makes sense in in uh, in a guillemot because the the wing loading is is the highest among seabirds. They, they work really hard during the breeding season, but uh, the authors also found that these energy requirements were, were high at the end of winter. Uh, so there was, a, there was a burst of activity, obviously, at the end of winter and, uh, and before breeding. Uh, interestingly, uh, we found exactly the same in, in great cormorants in, in Greenland, um, and we couldn't really understand why at the time uh, this, this surge in diving activity was occurring during the, uh, the breeding season. Um, what struck me uh, uh, once more is that these guillemots are really lazy flyers. Um, so it's, uh, they, they, they fly during the winter, it's, it's about half an hour uh, on per day, 90% of the days. Um, so not that a lot of, of flying, uh, but they, they were really astute uh, divers with, with about four hours uh, diving activity. Uh, each day, year on. So that's a lot of exercise. I, I wish I could get a bit of that exercise right now. Um, but even more impressive uh, to, uh, to me was uh, the level of nocturnal diving activity in winter. Um, and, and also the fact that according to the authors, these seem to be uh, an active choice. Um, I was really fascinated by that and, and we'll discuss it in a minute. And, and this is when I, I came up with the idea of uh, of uh, having this introduction with light swimming uh, at the beginning of the, of the session. So um, I, I have two questions for, for Ruth. Um, and, uh, and the first would be why, um, why the guillemots are not staying closer, even closer to the colony year round? And, uh, and if this may become an option in the future or maybe even right now, because you know, the, the data were collected 15 years ago, um, can you anticipate that you know the, the birds now with uh, a warming North Sea uh, will be even closer to home, or what will happen with that? So I'll I'll, I'll let you maybe talk about that aspect, uh, and then and then we'll get to the second question. Go for it, Ruth. You are online. Cool. Thank you. And uh, thanks for that overview of the paper as well. That was really cool to hear it all uh, spoken back to me in that way. Um. Yeah, so the year that we collected data from was 2005-2006, and that was a year when on the Isle of May there was a really low level of survival. So 
um, not that many, well, yeah, a large proportion of the population didn't return to the colony after that um, winter. And there was also a really low level of breeding success. And we also found that this year, actually, colony attendance was far lower than we've seen it, um, yeah, since then and previous to then as well. So um, we're not really sure what that interlink there is really. Um, but yeah, I think we are seeing increasingly over time, there are other PhD students who are working on this as well. So there's going to be more work coming out of the Isle of May to do with this. But we're seeing that they are, uh, the guillemots are returning more and more to the colony um, during the winter time. So I think, yeah, we just saw that they were back from January and then in, in increasing numbers through to April um, and kind of just in the early morning. But yeah, like I say, we're, we are seeing them coming back increasingly. Um, and we think that there must just be the local resources available to support this um, and that it must be a beneficial strategy for these guillemots and is something that is seen at other colonies as well. Um, I was speaking to some colleagues at uh, the University of Glasgow and they were saying that some of the colonies of common guillemots that they're studying that they're also seeing them increasingly returning to the colony during the non-breeding period. So yeah, it is a really interesting behaviour. Yeah, I, I found this quite quite striking, and and uh, of course the other point um, I, I wanted to to discuss was uh, this um, foraging activity in the dark. Um, I, I I find it really um, fascinating, and uh, I I wonder whether you you have any idea how they how they do that. Um, and 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 just a comment maybe before you you reply. Uh, there's there's new evidence um, now that uh, Tibet, especially Cormorants, um, uh, use acoustic clues uh, to uh, to locate prey uh, underwater. And uh, I I was wondering whether in, in guillemots this had uh, ever been considered. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we found that there was um, a couple of peaks in diving behavior throughout the annual cycle. And we'd predicted that if it was um, that guillemots were being constrained to dive at night time, then these peaks in um, dive activity generally during the day would also coincide with peaks in nocturnal foraging, meaning that birds were driven to kind of use this nocturnal time. But instead, we found that these peaks were mismatched. And that's why we kind of hypothesized that instead the birds were making this choice to forage um, during the night rather than just yeah, being forced to. Um, and it is interesting, yeah, because we do call guillemots visual foragers, and that's how we think they do catch the majority of their prey. Um, but there have been an increasing number of studies which have found similar results to us that they're diving when there's really low um, light levels. And we don't know whether that's still yeah, a visual thing, like you say, that they're using moonlight and starlight. We weren't able to look at that within, the, um, within this piece of work because of the uh, scheduling yeah, the regime of our sampling, we recorded, like you said, um, data every 15 or 30 days, which meant that we couldn't really look at lunar phases and that kind of thing, which could be quite cool to do in the future. Um, so yeah, I'm really not sure, like you say, whether there could be, um, whether they're using some visual cues or acoustics, that kind of thing. I think that would be really interesting to look into, but I'm afraid I can't yeah, expand on that really at the moment. Yeah, what, what I saw in, in the paper is that you, you said that um, in, in winter they seem to switch uh, to uh, feed on, on uh, bottom dwelling fish um, in, instead of more pelagic uh, sand eels, for, for instance. Um, and, uh, and these bottom dwelling fish, uh, they make much more noise uh, than, than actually uh, small pelagic fish. Uh, and this, this would be coherent. Uh, with with a strategy whereby you know uh, birds would use acoustic clues in the dark uh, to to try and get and get fish, uh, but again you know it's it's very uh, it's very speculative. Um, so um, uh, let's see what Grant has to say and uh, and what sort of questions come from the audience. Thanks, David. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty cool. How are you doing, Ruth? You, I'm well, thank you. Yeah, how are you? Surviving lockdown. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing well. Good, glad to hear. Um, my, I only had one sort of brief question about uh, whether or not you saw any relationship between, say, say daily colony activity uh, or daily colony attendance and energy expenditure. So if they were 
burning more calories at sea, for example, are they coming back to the colony more frequently uh, during the day or are they, um, are they, uh, is there no difference? Um, yeah, I suppose there's a trade-off in terms of the colony attendance because when they're at the colony, they're engaging in this central place foraging stuff where they're having to make their commuting trips out to sea. Um, but there are also the bonuses of being at the colony in terms of thermoregulation. So they've only got the air temperature deal to deal with as opposed to um, water. And they've also, guillemots obviously breed in such um, compact environments that they've also got the thermoregulation from those that they're standing next to um, as a benefit as well. But yeah. And also I suppose the energy budgets that we compiled as well, we're just kind of looking at these different activities so, um, and some different generic costs that we assign to those. Um, but it would be cool to, yeah, look into that a little bit more, the actual energetic cost of being at the colony as opposed to being at sea and, yeah, the trade-off between, yeah, like I say, that central place foraging and then the benefits of being at the colony as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be very curious to see if there was something like um, any relationships between energy expenditure and, and prey, uh, prey types, you know, if they're eating very good, you know, if they're eating good quality food, and they're able to come back to the colony uh, more frequently, whether or not chicks are surviving, uh, surviving better. And, um, you know, there's, I've, I feel like there's a whole, there's a whole series of, uh, of studies that, that could come out of work like this, that, that would be totally fascinating co for conservation purposes anyways, for sure. And uh, even just academically, um, how different prey items can, can impact um, population level biology. Yeah, yeah. Sophie Bennett is um, a second year PhD student at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and she's going to be looking at some of this stuff within her PhD. So she's got cameras on ledges and also TDRs and things, and she's going to be looking at how individuals are utilising different strategies. And I think she's going to be thinking about the energetics behind that as well. So that'll be really cool to see, hopefully coming out soon. Cool. Um, all right, before I open it up to the crowd, um, I just want to throw in a couple of uh, housekeeping things, just because we're... Uh, I didn't do it at the beginning, which is where I normally would put it. Um, but for those of you who haven't used Zoom before, if you open up your participants list in your chat box, which you would find by simply putting a cursor from your computer over your over my face, I guess, you'll see down at the bottom uh, participants list in a chat box. You open those up on the right hand side, you'll see down at the bottom uh, the participants list, a raise your hand option. So if you have a question, please click on that to raise your hand. Um, and if you can keep your questions moderately br brief and relatively light, and we'll, uh, this should help smooth things along pr relatively easily. The other, um, the other thing is that I'm recording this session. So if um, you don't want to be recorded, um, then don't raise your hand or uh, turn on your camera. And, um, or if you, if you do have an issue with it, please let me know afterwards and we can discuss. Um, in the meantime, I've got one question that's come in from the chat from Adrian, and he asks, did the, the nighttime activity increase with moon illumination? Um, yeah, so this was something that one of our reviewers asked about as well, and is something that, yeah, it would be fascinating to know more about, and I've still got a little bit of time left in my PhD, so maybe I can explore this more then. Um, but, yeah, as David mentioned earlier on, that we only rec uh, collected data um, the yeah the behavioral data was only collected every two weeks or every month um, and because we put the loggers on at a similar time yeah the, the data kind of came in these funny steps which meant that we weren't able to look at um, moonlight as much as we would have liked to um, but previous papers um, have suggested that yeah moonlight and starlight could really be important to these birds so that's definitely yeah, an interesting question to look at going forward potentially. Mm -hmm. Very good. He says thank you. Do we <laughs> any question? Any questions from the crowd? Do we have? Uh, please use the raise your hand option, or if you have your camera on, you can wave frantically at the camera, and I might be able to see you. And and in the meantime, uh, Ruth. Uh, so so I guess there has been such uh, deployments of uh, other winters of, of GLSs. What what would be the, the norm? Well, the normal return rate uh, for GLSs in in uh, less uh, testing uh, winters for the birds. Um, 
I'm not sure actually. I should really know that and I will have some stuff out soon because I'm currently working on a seven year GLS data set and I know that the return rates are higher, but I can't tell you what they are off the top of my head. Okay, because probably what uh, you know, people will be asking is, is how this return rate compares uh, with um, over winter mortality rates um, of unequipped birds, for, for instance. Um, yeah, I've just received um, knowledge that we get about 70% of them back. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sophie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And handy to have one of them around. I know, yeah. <laughs> so, do you still have more more field work to do? Will you be Will you be tagging more birds in the future, or is this uh, is your um, all the field work done for this now? Um, yeah, I've been really fortunate during my PhD that a lot of the data that I'm working on, obviously in 2005, I was 12 or something. So, I've been really fortunate to come into a lot of this data. Um, but yeah, there's always ongoing work on the Isle of May. And yeah, um, Sophie Bennett and Leela Buckingham as well are both going to be working on orcs and their overwinter behaviour in the future. So um, yeah, we're kind of on hold for this year, obviously, but mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see how yeah. it goes. Those poor birds left, <laughs> left alone with no tags on them. You know, they'll be missing us, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, we've got a question from Morgan. Let's see. Uh, all right, you are on muted, Morgan. Go for it. Hi, thanks. I'm Morgan Brown from the University of Amsterdam. Um, I was just looking at the figures in the paper, particularly figure four, where you report the energy, well, the time and energy spent throughout the year. And the energy allocated towards diving is incredibly consistent year round, if I'm reading this correctly. And I was wondering if you had any insights into that with regard to um, presumably their diving behaviors when they're um, yeah, getting the resources, right? So does that mean they have a fairly regular resource intake throughout the year? Or do you think some periods this, they're more successful than others? Um, yeah, anyways. Yeah, sure, thank you for that. Um, so yeah, we found that they were diving more at different times. So you can kind of see in that 4A that there are like potentially three peaks. So maybe during the breeding season, they're diving a bit more and then at two other different times during the non-breeding season. Um, but guillemots are extremely efficient divers, and that's basically why we don't see this um, then hugely impacting their energy budgets. So they've got the really small wings which reduce their drag underwater, um, and they've also got less air in their plumage, which means their buoyancy is slightly reduced, um, which just means that, yeah, they've got far lower um, energetic costs associated with diving than you would expect from um, a similar bird, I suppose. Um, and yeah, there's been work done on the seasonal effects of changes in body composition um, on diving marine mammals. Um, and we do know that orcs put on a lot of fat immediately after the breeding season and that this could affect their diving capabilities. Whereas the equation that we used to calculate energy expenditure is just based on estimates from the breeding season. Um, so there might be some differences that we're not able to account for here yet. Um, but yeah, I think that's some something really interesting again going forward um, when we're taking these year-round approaches to ecology and physiology that would be really cool to look into a bit more yeah and and, and this is why there's this subtle but important difference between energy requirements and energy expenditure um, and, and and the fact that here you know you, you work on energy requirements uh, calculated energy requirements and, and not actual energy expenditure or, or, or yield Yeah, yeah, that's true. And we do know so little as well about what these birds are actually consuming um, during the non-breeding season. And so how their diving behavior and that kind of thing will have to change. You mentioned, yeah, that I cite one paper which was looking at um, the insides of birds and what they've been eating, but there, there really is um, only a handful of these studies. Um, yeah, so there's definitely a lot of knowledge gaps which would be really interesting to continue to fill, yeah. Very lovely. Well, thanks a lot, Ruth. That, that was great. And uh, thanks, Morgan, for the question and to Adrian. I think we'll, uh, we'll shovel along to the next, uh, next paper now. Um, Ruth, if you do have any questions or anything like that, of course, feel free to raise your hand. And uh, if anyone has any questions for, for Ruth, please pop it down into the group chat. And um, if she feels like it, she might answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Ruth. All right. 
Um, and the next paper, of course, is going to be, uh, as I had been mentioned earlier, will be one that was um, put together by the jubilant James Russell. Now, all of us here are totally aware of the devastating impacts that introduced house mice mice have on seabird populations um, in certain parts of the world. And, you know, you've probably seen the horrendous images of mice eating through albatross chicks on Gulf Island. Um, I mean, not only is that a horrendous way to die, but it's uh, the impact of that um, on potential recruitment is, is actually quite astounding, especially for already vulnerable populations. But, you know, as, as we know, mice can do more than just eat seabird chicks. In fact, they can impact almost every aspect of an island's terrestrial ecosystem from plants to invertebrates. And that can have other knock-on effects uh, within an ecosystem. And now, so because mice are omnivorous, uh, they're able to take advantage of these different types of food sources. So in, on seabird islands where they've been introduced, this sort of begs the question, so how much of a mouse's diet is actually made up of seabirds? Uh, so are they, are they eating other things and how much of those things are being, are being eaten? So this, this paper that, that was led by, uh, by James at the University of Auckland takes a, an interesting approach to measuring the impact of house mice on island ecosystems using stomach content analysis and stable isotope analysis. Uh, and it gives us some insight into that question of how much of a mouse's diet is made up of seabirds. Um, so the study site in this paper was on the uh, amazing Antipodes Islands, which are just shy of about 900 kilometers southeast of New Zealand, where uh, introduced house mice on the main island had been impacting the ecosystem for just about a century, or just over a century. Interestingly, and this is this is quite a cool fact is uh, the evidence suggests that all mice on that the main island from the antipodes um comes from a single ship the president that, that was the french that was the french i, I learned on that occasion that's How right. shameful yeah. i know it was the it was the french oh my god and and uh, and and the ship was called uh, um, edgar Faure, who, who also was a french president and and died a, a very infamous uh, death <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah, we get blame the we'll French. Try, we'll try not to speak too long about it. No, I, I, I don't want to hurt your your ego. That would be a shame. <laughs> it was a French bark, and she sank uh, off the island in 1908. And uh, the it seems like the entire population came from that one shipwreck, which is totally uh, totally wild. Anyways, thanks to all the hard work of some dedicated conservation biologists, the the some. I think 200,000 strong population of house mice, and James might be able to speak more about how many house mice there actually were on the island. Um, they were completely eradicated uh, from the main Antipodes Island in 2016. So a lot of the work presented in this paper um, serves mostly as a nice blueprint for understanding the role of introduced mice on the island ecosystems. So they, uh, they basically put out um, traps, so and they put in invertebrate traps, uh, the pitfall traps, uh, and they were placed around the, the main Anti Antipodes Islands at key sites and also on several control sites. So these were, off the control sites were offshore islands that, and rocks that were, that were free of mice. Um, they used snap traps and live traps to capture the mice on the sites. Uh, mice captured in the snap traps were, uh, had their stomach contents analyzed, so they were removed and analyzed, while the live traps were used um, to capture mice so they could be euthanized, which would preserve the integrity of the liver, uh, which is what they use for stable isotope analyses. Um, temporally, the study focuses on, on summer and winter seasons, um, which gives kind of a good dichotomy of the ecosystem structures from, from which they can draw conclusions on in the paper. Um, what was really interesting is that there was a very clear clustering of the uh, makeup, the invertebrate, pop the invertebrate populations, um, at the sites where um, where they they were catching uh, where where mice were and were not present, so um, at sites where there were mice, they found that uh, coleopterids made up so these sort of the beetles I guess would make up approximately about thirty six percent of the invertebrates, um, and that didn't really differ between winter and summer months. However, on the offshore islands with no mice. Um, it seemed that the population was made up of nearly 50% of the coleopterids. Now they only measured stomach content for about 20 mice, so it's not, not a huge sample size, um, but 
uh, it gave some really interesting insights into what they were finding in uh, in these animals. So they they um, although the invertebrates made up a large part of the diet, nine of the eleven mice that were sampled in April 2016 had bird remains in it. So uh, it was actually quite a significant number of mice were eating birds. Um, at this point, it, it wasn't distinguished whether or not they were seabirds or land birds, but the, uh, all of the vertebrate remains in the mice were had feathers, so they were presumed to be from birds. Um, the stable isotope analysis used uh, nearly 400 samples, so it's quite a large sample size, um, and the pertinent results were kind of summarized in table four of the paper. Um, in summer months, the analysis suggested that the diet of the mice is primarily composed of land birds and invertebrates, um, and in the summer months, with only about 11% um, of the diet was composed of seabirds. In the winter, stay, the, the analysis suggested a much higher proportion of mouse diet being made up of seabirds, which was about 30%, um, with the major part of the diet being, uh, being plants. And I thought that was, that was really cool. I thought it was a nice way of really looking at, um, you know, what, how much these, these little critters are actually eating uh, eating seabirds and uh, you know there's a there's a lot of really cool work that obviously can can come from this looking at um, you know what the real we can, we can start looking at what the real impact is of large populations of mice on um, on seabirds and ecosystems as a whole um, so James how are, how are you doing today I've got you unmuted there now Good, good. No, uh, thanks for the invitation, Grant and, and David. It's and it's nice to see some some general antipodian faces in the audience. Johannes, Joe, and uh, and Warner, among others. Oh, very good. And uh, you guys, you're surviving lockdown well, I assume. You're looking you're looking well and happy, anyways. I am. I just had a very uh, as I as I was telling you earlier, I've um. I, I live just 30 minutes uh, drive from a prosolarid mainland colony. So I just drive to the end of the, the road in my electric car and um, go out and wrangle gray faced petrels in people's backyards nowadays. And it's the prospecting season at the moment, but we've been <laughs> locked down for the entirety of it, which is breaking my heart. So um, I, I live on the edge of the forest and I have a permit to ban land birds. So I've become, as you, as you said, a lonely land bird ecologist for uh, the last month. And yeah, um, I was saying. just packing up the nets packing up the nets an hour ago and I thought I'll just close the nets down and one fantail attracted a second fantail which attracted a third fantail which attracted a more pork uh, and by good. that point I had four birds and shit was getting real and going crazy and I wasn't <laughs> sure I was going to make it on time but uh all birds were safely released and as far as I'm concerned no birds were consumed in the, the making of that uh, evening affair. <laughs> Thank God for that. Hey, so uh, I've got a couple of quick questions for you. So the first, um, which I was interested about in the um, the invertebrate uh, aspect of this, I thought that was quite interesting, and, and particularly because invert pop populations can be are highly related to the the plant eco plant um, ecosystem and the plant structure of a um, of a of a community. And um, you had measured um, the the invert population using pitfall traps in these control sites and these non-control sites. And I was wondering if there was any baseline uh, data that suggested that the original population of these, these inverts was, uh, or the makeup of those populations was originally the same on the rock island, on those offshore islands and on the main Antipodes island. So was there a difference um, between those initially to be able to say that the difference that you're detecting is actually due to the mice, or is that just the structure of the population? Yeah, that's a, that's a really fair question. Uh, in particular, those offshore rock stacks are only in the order of a, a hectare or two, so they're they're much smaller. But uh, the Antipodes is a really simplified ecosystem. It's basically just um, tussock grassland, and that's it, and the odd bit of fern and and tiny tiny shrubbery. Um, so uh, what I did do was the pitfall sampling on the main island was stratified by altitude from the coast up to the higher points and I did just do a little check that I took out the high altitude samples from the main island and only compared the coastal samples from the main island to the, the offshore uh, rock stacks um, to check that they were relatively similar. Obviously it would have been great if my time machine was working and I could have gone back a hundred years um, before the French arrived and uh, and work out what was going on there, but um, it was broken, 
And so I just, um, I just did that comparison. It turned out it didn't matter. It really didn't matter in the scheme of things whether I included the, um, the altitude effect or not. Um, and the, the order of the, the magnitude difference, if you look in, um, if you look in the, uh, at, at the figure two at the non-metric multidimensional scaling in the paper, you just see, as you see, that really tight clustering where the, the, that mouse impact on the main island had completely constrained, just homogenized all of the invertebrate communities. Um, whereas if you go off to the offshore stacks, you just see the abundance blow out by orders of magnitude. And um, there's, if anything, you'd have expected it to go the other way, that the offshore stacks would have been more depauperate just because of their exposure and, and tinier sizes. So, um, yeah, there's always going to be a bit of variation, a bit of an unanswered question there. But again, it's like a classic statistical question when the magnitude of the effect is that strong. It's, um, you don't need much sample size to know that there's something significant going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually that, that clustering in that figure was, was totally wild. It just... It really highlights how how these animals could potentially um, totally alter uh, an ecosystem structure, and obviously, like I said, there are there are knock on effects um, that obviously you you couldn't have measured in in this in this paper, um, but you know that's that's stuff that would be really interesting to apply across various uh, various islands. Like if you went to Gough Island, you know what's the what's the ecosystem make up there now? compared to, uh, you know, compared to what you have on the Antipodes. And of course, now that the, uh, the mice have been eradicated, there'll be, uh, there'll be a whole bunch of interesting things to come from that and how the, the ecosystem may recover. Do you, have, do you have any idea of that? Like, do you have any predictions as to how you think the, the uh, invertebrate population is, gonna, is going to come back around on, on the island? You know, the, the go slow that academic publishing is actually means by the time this paper had come out, it had already been four years after the eradication. and We'd already seen most of these effects anyway. When the, um, when the team went back, uh, there's a Graham Elliott and Kath Walker doing their, um, their Antipo Antipodian Wandering Albatross long-term study there, went back one year later or the summer after, and immediately they noticed that um, flies had just absolutely exploded on the main island, um, and so that was one impact they, one effect they noticed. And then the the uh, eradication confirmation team went back two years later in 2018 winter because that's our rule of thumb: just wait two years, and it's pretty obvious if you failed mm. or or not. And um, they got a really gorgeous shot of a, an Antipodes pipit hopping around with a caterpillar, giant caterpillar in its mouth, and we'd never even seen a caterpillar on oh. the island. So this um. This pipette just, you could, all, you could see it was smiling. It just had this grin on its face like, here's my tasty <laughs> caterpillar treat. So, um, yeah, those changes have happened um, really rapidly and, and really, really strongly. And, and we've also got some good um, land bird monitoring data using um, some pretty robust distance sampling methods that have shown the, the pipettes, the snipe, and the, the parakeets. There's only four native land birds on the island have just um, exploded in numbers afterwards so um i mean it's just it's just the consistent story the world over isn't it Man, remove pest mammals um ecosystem explodes and, and joyous positive impacts immediately afterwards immediately mm -hmm. yeah that's super cool um and, and you know, sort of um i guess along those lines i'm curious like you so say in your paper you you describe how they're um they're um eating more what seems to be more seabirds um into winter months and i'm wondering what what seabirds are around in the winter months for them to eat and how are they catching them? It seems like that's, that's sort of like not really the breeding season, which was when I would expect there to, them to be taking chicks. So the, um, this is the typical story with island eradications, that the monitoring you do after the fact is a reflection of what, um, what pre-data you have. And the pre-data you have comes down to the serendipity of what scientists had happened to go out. And um, the reason I got to go out was just by coincidence that um, Richard Cuthbert was at uh, RSPB at the time working the golf problem with the mice and, and his partner, Erica Summer, was working, um, leading the uh, NIWA, um, uh, the uh, White and Petrol monitoring program down there. And they thought somebody should have a peek on the mice there to see what was going on. And my lucky number came up, so I got a berth on the boat to do that. So um, I was... Uh, I was down there looking at the, the mice and that's uh, when we started to get a picture of what was going on on the ecosystem. So gray petrels are the only winter breeding species there. What I suspect is happening is we don't actually have strong evidence that the mice were directly uh, preying upon the seabirds on that system. We suspect they're getting into um, the storm petrels because they probably do that everywhere just given the small size of those, the adults are vulnerable as well as the 
the chicks and the eggs. Um, but uh, I suspect come winter, what we're actually just seeing is scavenging of um, the, the dead chicks and leftovers from uh, the end of the, the summer months, really. I think it's primarily a scavenging um, exercise there. Mm -hmm. That's that's really interesting. And so the the, um, the stable isotopes that you're measuring in the liver, uh, what's the sort of turnover time of uh, in, in the liver? So is it the signal that you're getting, is that reflective of what they've e eaten within the last, say, 10 days? Or is that something that's reflective of something they've eaten in the last, you know, three months? It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a mix over uh, over the last um, over the last recent while that they've eaten. So uh, yeah, it's not exactly able to be pinned down to that was just their their last meal exactly. So um, so we, yeah, we're building up that picture there. We also collected bone and muscle um, so if we wanted to consider looking at the different temporal turnovers of that. But because we had such large sample size and were limited by budget, we only pursued the the liver at the time. So uh, yeah, that was how that uh, settled down. Mm -hmm. Um, and the last question I've got for you is about sort of in table four, you show that there's, there's actually, it seems to be the standard deviations in some of these estimates are relatively high. And is that, and that, is that a reflection of individual variation in the animals or is this, or is there something else? Um, yeah, certainly from the work we've done um, with invasive rats elsewhere, um, although uh, as a population, they're, you know, broadly omnivorous, any, they can eat anything. As individuals, they're actually highly specific, like um, like all of us under our different lockdowns. There's probably a particular food we're craving because that's our thing, and mice are exactly like that too. And that started to shine through in that um, that stomach sampling, in particular. You know, the mice living in the, the outskirts of the penguin colony were really keen in on um, penguin remains and and the the uh, intima fauna associated with that. So yeah, you do get that high uh, level of individual specialization. I suspect that's playing a role in um in blowing out the standard deviations. But of course, we're always just limited by the um, uh, the types of models we fit in these uh, stable isotope mixing models and, and how they come out in the mix. So we, we just saw that subtle change, um, clear but subtle nonetheless, like you uh, emphasized from summer to winter of that change in diet, really emphasizing the, the fact that like all seabird islands uh, in the colder regions, they're driven by those summer trophic fountains, which um, fuel the ecosystem over a few months while breeding of seabirds is going crazy. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot, James. David, do you have some questions for... Uh... Yeah, may maybe just a quick one. Uh, and, and it's probably really hard to assess, but I, I was trying to, to, uh, to figure out how quickly uh, mice uh, initially move through such a, an island and, and, uh, and exhaust um, its, its resources. Um, are there any, any ways to retrace this uh, through any paleo records? Um, are there any studies of the kind? The, the speed, with regards to the speed of invasion of um, rats across an island, the best example we have is an island called Big South Cape off the southern end of New Zealand and it's a thousand hectares and um, rats arrived and within two years uh, one, one, a very small number of rats, perhaps just a pregnant female, landed on that island. Within two years they were across the entirety of that island at low density and by the end of the third year they were at high density. So it essentially takes um, uh, two to three years for a, a thousand hectare island to be fully invaded. And similarly, we actually did an experimental invasion. My um, PhD student went to a, a small six hectare island and we cleared the mice off it and purposely put a male and female back and it took them just six months to, uh, to uh, invade that six hectare island. So with regards to that um, invasion of uh, Antipodes Island in real time, um, it would have happened within uh, two years or three years and that's why we have that rule of thumb following eradications that you could invest lots of money and um, do complex rapid eradication assessments models which is another area of work I do say so if you wanted to confirm your eradication within four weeks or eight weeks or six months but um, the cheapest approach is just to do nothing and then after two years um, the mice will be everywhere again and you will notice them just by staying in the hut or or they will be confirmed eradicated um, I, the other interesting question, what this paper was really trying to grapple at was this, this wider question around why are these mice um, starting to turn on seabirds now for the first time? And we first observed that, and it's still the most horrific, on Gough Island, where just about every species is impacted, and then it's been observed on Marion. Um, it's now also happening in the tropics on Midway Atoll, and um, Waiteki is working at uh, University of uh, Northern Illinois with Holly Jones on that for her. Um, 
graduate research, which is really exciting. We're building in the, um, the Antipodes Island stable isotope data for a larger global study on, on that. So watch her for some really exciting results there. And uh, my colleague at TAF in um, the Ilze Pass has also seen on Tromala that the, the mice are turning onto the red-footed boobies there as well. Um, but what's interesting is that it's not just the chicks that are gone for. So on Midway Atoll, it's um, actually the time of year that the mice turn onto the seabirds is during the um, egg incubation phase. And so it's the adult albatross that are being attacked. And when the chicks hatch a few months later, the mice are no longer feeding on the seabirds. So there's this wider hypothesis we're starting to form, which is that it's about a kind of nutrient diet limitation factor. That means at a particular time of year, the mice might switch on to, to these seabirds. So uh, I think what, uh, what's happening is that Gough Island, uh, I know the mice have been there and Marion, the mice have been there for hundreds, multiple hundreds of years, two, 300 years. On Antipodes Island, they'd only been there for 100 years. So I suspect um, they arrive. And as, as we showed in our paper at the, the so-called early stage in the first century, they just work their way through the tastiest um, uh, invertebrates. And then once they've eaten most of them, they move to the less tasty ones. And then when they run out of invertebrates or what other preferred food resources they are, they then switch on to the seabirds more out of desperation um, because that's a much more behaviorally risky um, food uh, item to be, to be taking on. That's what I think is happening there. So in terms of how long does it take for the mice to switch on to the seabirds, I think that's a case of um, burning out the entire ecosystem. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. You know, I have, I have to share this little little factoid that uh, that Jan shared in the group chat, just in case somebody anybody here is not following along. Uh, Jan says rats begin breeding as soon as five weeks of age and continue until the age of two. Uh, females are fertile approximately every three weeks, and during that time, they've been known to mate up to five hundred times in six hours. The resulting pregnancy usually lasts about three weeks, and the litter size typically ranges from six to twenty babies. That is absolutely mind bending. And I reckon if that's that must be somewhat similar to rat with uh, with mice, hey Jane? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um in, in these colder areas they just breed over the summer period and it drops down to only one or two percent breeding activity over winter. But uh the area we're doing a lot of work in now is the tropics where um these animals are just breeding all year round. So those those numbers are absolutely um, on the mark every three weeks, another litter gets pumped out and it's just happening again um, and again and again and again. Jeez. All right, folks, let's, uh, let's open it up to questions from the, uh, from the audience. And we've got uh, Lorna's poke, put something on her, on her screen there. So let me unmute you. There you go. Go for it, Lorna. Hi, James. Nice to see you. Hey, Lorna. Um, a bit off topic, but I was curious, did they notice any effect of uh, the increased flies, the uh, fly population? I'm just thinking that I think I, I heard repeatedly in hot summers down at Tarewa Head for the royal albatross, for the chicks, they get fly blown in hot summers. I don't know if that's an issue on the antipodes at all, but I'm not, on a summer, I'm not aware of bouncing back off an ecosystem into like extreme probably just one season but yeah thank you yeah I'm, uh, I'm not aware of any um any flow on effects from those changes in the invertebrates on on things such as that obviously as we're we're probably all sadly aware the antipodium wandering albatross has gone through about a 50 percent population crash over the last two decades because um they are incredibly vulnerable to the long line fisheries that are roaming the uh the uh, high seas uh, in the Pacific, and so that's the the primary threat to to those guys. Um, one of the sad instances where the the eradication isn't going to benefit them so much. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Thanks, Lorna. Thank you. All right. Do we have any more questions from the crowd? Not seeing any hands up. David, do you have any more comments or questions for James over here? Well, rather about uh, the, the when well, you talked uh, um, a bit uh, about it previously, but the, the next uh, developments for um, monitoring after eradication on, on that island and island group. Um, so I, I firmly adhere to a conservation biology worldview, which is the, the problems being solved 
for me to, to go back there. There's an interesting debate that, that, that kind of trickles along in the literature, which is the, the role of monitoring in, in eradications, because um, obviously monitoring generates scientific information, which is great if you're curious um, for your own sake in that, but it also comes at a cost, which might uh, prevent you being able to work on other projects. So uh, uh, the, the Antipodean Wandering Albatross team goes back every year and they were involved with the eradication, so they keep collecting data. But um, Antipodes Island is, is a very remote place and it costs 12,000 US one way uh, to get there. So uh, what we're focusing on now is we use that to leverage up to Auckland Island, which is uh, 48,000 uh, hectares and we've spent the last um, three years now there scoping that for the eradication of uh, pigs and cats and mice and we're just finishing up that project now and we've worked out that um, the eradication of those three pest species from that island is feasible um, for a price tag of about 60 million um, US dollars. Unfortunately the, the economic impacts of COVID-19 are probably going to derail any immediate action there but I would urge um, anyone that's interested in sub-Antarctic uh, seabird Islands, that there's a special issue of the journal Natornis, the New Zealand Journal of Ornithology, just um, online this month, uh, uh, which Colin Miscali organised called Lost Gold, and it's about the, the birds of uh, Auckland Island, and really there, previous to that, there had not been a, a single volume on the, the birds of Auckland Island, so there's a great compilation of papers there on the seabirds and the lamb birds, and, and I um, contributed a mega chapter on the impacts of mammals on the, the birds of those islands. So that's that's the next um, stage. That's the next thing in our sites in New Zealand. That's the last uh, sub-Antarctic island we need to clear of invasive mammals. And that would open a huge amount of habitat for, uh, for our uh, breeding seabirds down there. Um, but of course, as everyone's hopefully aware, New Zealand has some pretty ambitious goals to keep going to bigger and bigger islands until we do the largest one, which is otherwise known as uh, the South Island of New Zealand. And uh, We'll get there, but um, the, the immediate uh, stumbling block to that, as it is in the tropics, is the, the role of humans on these islands, because um, unlike <laughs> mice don't really get a say in how we do eradications, but humans tend to have a lot of opinions about how, where, and when we should do our eradications. So we're, we're moving into the brave new frontier of social science um, in the, the eradication uh, field uh, and even uh, actually in our seabird biology if i'm fortunate enough to have prosolarids breeding and um recovering just outside of auckland city um 30 minutes drive from my house that's also a social science project so um i'm just uh passing the hat around to get some funding to get a kind of social science history uh, yeah. phd started on that in the next year or so yeah that's that's actually a really really interesting point and this may this may seem like a kind of a silly comic or question but you know, obviously in the South Island, there's a huge pushback against uh, eradicating some some of the animals. You know, hunters, for example, are really uh, anti-eradication, and uh, and certainly cat owners. There's a lot of cats in the South Island, and people don't necessarily want to get rid of them. And I know even on Stewart Island, they had a you know, hard time uh, convincing people that cats were a nuisance. So. Do you see any pushback at all from the public on doing eradications on uh, on these offshore sub Antarctic islands? You know, are are there people who are you know the particularly the anti ten eighty folks? Are they really pushing back against uh, against this in any way? Not really. Um, New Zealanders are a pretty good sort um, all up, and although those islands are uninhabited, they still have a social component in that people care about them and and Naita who have a, a claim to it. In fact, um. Uh, Polynesian voyages, not, not even Maori precursors to that. The Polynesians made it as far down as Auckland Islands in the 13th century and hung out there for a, a summer by the looks of it and then decided it wasn't for them. Um, so, uh, but there's really, New Zealanders are pretty supportive of these eradications and supportive in that sense that they don't need to see the tangible benefits, even if it's somewhere they'll never go. Most New Zealanders have never seen a kākāpō, but they'll still um, fight tooth and claw to, uh, to save uh, kākāpō. And, and furthermore, we talk about, to go back to what we're saying about monitoring data, we always have the sense that, uh, uh, you know, if we collect enough monitoring data, we can demonstrate the worth. But my, my sense is New Zealanders actually just believe these rats and mice and other pests shouldn't be there as a as a as a, a statement of fact and so they don't actually need to be shown the benefits of them being removed they just think it's it's a right thing to do in and of itself which is a diff bit of a different approach so we're really lucky I, I realize how lucky we are in new zealand that when you pop up and suggest something like uh, we're going to entirely wipe out a, uh, three species from auckland island um you just get uh, a round of applause from your fellow countrymen 
just a really great feeling. Yeah, and that's that's uh, that's really interesting because that uh, that goes along with the fact that uh, for for some people, you know, you you value uh, biodiversity even if you're not directly in in contact with it, uh, and and you don't you don't actually see it on the on a daily basis. Uh, that's uh, that's really interesting. You ju you just enjoy the fact that you know wild animals and wild nature is is still out there even if you don't get to it, right? Yeah, and uh, and and I should say that um, with uh, the other the other place we have our sites now, uh, David is working with um, with TAF on the French subantarctic islands because there's a bunch of very doable eradications there. So we're currently um, setting up a kind of working group with uh, the TAF team, La Réunion, um, particularly Amsterdam Islanders in their sites for the eradication of cats in Norway, rats and mice in particular for conservation of Amsterdam albatross, but also uh, all the other seabird species there. So um, it's only going to be a matter of time before those are cleared. Unfortunately, the Gough Island eradication had to be um, postponed this year because of COVID-19. But the, uh, the good news from that is they had uh, uh, 20 tonne of bait going away for free. So I've managed to pick up on that and we'll be re-delivering that to French Polynesia <laughs> where we are going to be um, implementing a, an eradication of Marlon Brando's private atoll, Tetiroa, this well, year. Sadly, without my, uh, my presence as I had hoped because I've been working there for the last 10 years to get it in place. Um, but um, we'll be working through a now two year stage process to eliminate the, the ship rats and the Polynesian rats from, from that island as well. So there's just, um, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be in um, predator management and, and to see the benefits for, for seabird conservation and then the, the opportunities for land bird reintroductions around the world that that creates. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's uh, quite a score you got there, mate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so uh, do we have any more questions from the audience while we're here? Um, we're getting pretty close to the time, so if anyone has any quick questions, please feel free to raise their hands. Um, and if not, James, I do, uh, do want to say I do love those, uh, are they taxidermied seabirds in the background? Am I seeing a puffin, a razorbill, and a, what looks, or is that a, I don't know, maybe not a razorbill, but the, uh, and the other one's a little blue penguin, is that right? You've got it. Oh, Give the man a prize. Tell you. <laughs> the, um, for the, the, the little penguin has a bit of an elongated neck. The taxidermist took a bit of liberty um, with it. Um, for those uh, that care, it's the, the white flippered variety off the, the Canterbury coast uh, there in a, a razorbill and winter plumage and uh, a Faroes Island uh, puffin that I believe somebody uh, enjoyed the insides of and, and I inherited the outsides <laughs> of. Uh, can I bring them closer to the camera? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, here is the white flipper penguin. You can oh. see the defining characteristic is the white flipper. Oh, beautiful, yeah. This one was on Trade Me, which is New Zealand's eBay for the bargain price of a uh, hundred US dollars. It was on Trade know, Me. <laughs> <laughs> that poor, poor razor bill looks like he's seen better days. <laughs> <laughs> an old one. And, uh, and then uh, Miss Puffin's got herself all dolled up for a night on the town. Oh, she's beautiful. Oh, yeah. She's gorgeous. And uh, yeah, I just had to get that one through biosecurity. Actually, it's a funny story for those of you familiar with New Zealand biosecurity. They were so uh, hung up on the three dead mice I was bringing in from the Faroe Islands. The mice on the Faroe Islands are fascinating because the Vikings introduced them a thousand years ago and have radiated to have subspecies status. So they're one of the precursors to a, a native uh, introduced species. Um, and uh, they got so hung up on them. They're like, what are these uh, mice? Yeah, but what are they? mice yeah but what are they they're mice <laughs> but they overlooked the fact that there was a puffin in my bag so i got a rather terse phone call the following day from the ministry of biosecurity saying um we believe you smuggled a, a puffin into the country said, no no it was on my card and they insisted on <laughs> taking uh, miss puffin back and fumigating her so uh she got uh, an all expenses paid uh, trip to the fumigation chamber and <laughs> came back to me beautiful <laughs> have you tried shining a, an infra a black light on its bill yet I haven't actually. Um, I should get that. We use that. We've got the infrared. Uh, yeah, we've got those lights because we use them for the biomarker uptake to see um, that 100% of the mice and rats are taking the bait. So yeah, I'll have to have to do that. Yeah, we're, we're expecting that and then a, a picture online at some point. <laughs> I will do. When I get into the lab to get the UV light back. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, thanks a lot, James. And um, thanks a lot to everybody who joined us today. And thanks, of course, to the authors uh, for some really awesome work. We've, uh, again, had another lovely, uh, lovely Seabird session. We'll be back again next week um, at um, 1600 GMT for, uh, for those of us in Europe to try and accommodate our North American colleagues. Um, and then in two weeks time, we'll be back to, back to this time slot. So again, thanks again, James. Thanks, Ruth, for your awesome papers. Thanks, David, for being a fantastic uh, uh, nego negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for being a fantastic negotiator. I'm not quite sure what we're negotiating, but uh, I'm, I'm down with that. All right, take care everyone and stay safe. Stay inside, clean your hands, wash your face. Wash, brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Take care now. Bye, everyone.